this is the hardware and software session, so I think it's about time we redress the balance. So I'm, I'm the director of quantum applications at, at SciQuantum. Uh, and uh, if you attended our, our keynote yesterday, you'll probably be more familiar with SciQuantum as a, as a hardware company. You know, largely speaking, the majority of the employees at SciQuantum are singularly focused on delivering large-scale photonic quantum hardware. But of course, we also have a vested interest in building useful and commercially relevant applications for that hardware. And so, in fact, I lead a team of 20 people at SciQuantum, all of them quantum application developers, who are singularly focused on, well, in generality, building uh, quantum algorithms and quantum applications for large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computers. Uh, but more specifically, in designing quantum algorithms for the, the kinds of devices that SciQuantum is planning to build. So that is closely incorporating algorithm development with the architecture and the hardware that sits underneath. Now, one of the things that folks outside of quantum application development say to me most often, and it's been said to me two or three times this week, is that there aren't enough of you. There aren't enough quantum application developers, and you aren't developing quantum applications at a fast enough rate. And I, I share both of those sentiments, but to some extent, I want to convince you in this session that this is a problem that is partially of our own making. And so the goal for the next 20 minutes is for me to tell you what I believe one of the key problems are in, in developing quantum applications today and how we go about fixing it. Before we get there though, just a little bit of a, a preamble. So maybe this slide is, is less relevant for this iteration of Q2B, but many years ago, PsyQuantum was pretty contrarian in claiming that uh, large-scale error-corrected quantum computers were necessary to deliver meaningful, commercially useful applications. That is now no longer the case. That's an opinion that's shared by uh, a large number of other players in the space, both in academia and in the private sector, and across hardware vendors, folks that are writing quantum software, and also entities that will ultimately be end users of, of quantum computers themselves. However, there's obviously a gulf in capabilities between the machines that we have access to today and the kind of devices that we need to build in order to derive commercial advantage. So the majority of the roadmaps of the, the entities that you see on this slide that have been publicly disclosed aim for devices with millions of qubits of a sufficient quality to be below the error correction threshold for whatever error correcting code they plan on, on implementing. But despite this gulf in capabilities, I'm sure every hardware vendor that has given a talk over the last few days has told you, you know, very explicitly that they, you know, they have lots of plans for scale and all the problems that they face with scalability are all going to be magically solved and they'll get there within this decade. And in fact, you know, we've seen many of those talks uh, throughout the week. And guess what? PsyQuantum is no different in that regard. But it's worth saying that for fault tolerance to arrive that quickly, we don't all need to be right. It's not the case that every single entity on that previous slide needs to execute faithfully on their roadmap for the fault-tolerant era to begin. Everyone else could fail bar one company and the fault-tolerant era would still be upon us. Okay, so that's just something about the, the scale of hardware. The good news is that we are increasingly confident in our ability to uh, run useful applications on machines of that scale. So this is just a plot of uh, a smattering of quantum algorithms that have been explicitly compiled as a function of time, plotted against the computational volume. And I, I want to be very clear here. The y-axis here is not the, the IBM coined notion of quantum volume. By volume here, I just mean the product of the number of logical qubits with the number of logical operations, in this case, the number of Toffoli gates, plotted as a function of time. And there are two things that I want to highlight from this plot. One is that, unlike NISC, I can be very explicit about resource estimates for algorithms, even in advance of the hardware being here. So they, they lack the heuristic nature that you might expect from NISC algorithms. I can put a very specific dot on this plot with a very minimal error bar and be very confident about the resources needed to run a particular algorithm. The other thing to say is that resource counts for algorithms have dropped significantly uh, as a function of time, often by you know, very significant amounts. 
I've been at Cyquantum for just over four years. The field has faithfully dropped you know, co common benchmark algorithms like finding the ground state energy of FOMOCO or solving elliptic curve cryptography by an order of magnitude a year for the last six or seven years. However, that previous slide does belie the difficulty in deriving resource estimates for these problems. So going from a broad computational statement through to an explicitly specified quantum algorithm, compiled all the way down to low-level instructions, and then the tedious bookkeeping of doing the, the resource estimation itself. And we are not immune from this. This is a uh, pain that we equally share. So this is a paper that we published in March this year. It was uh, a paper specifically that was aiming to compute a variety of molecular observables for uh, essentially arbitrary quantum chemical systems that we co-published with our friends at Boehringer, Ingelheim, and QC Ware. And uh, it's worth noting that in building this algorithm, the high-level structure of the algorithm itself was known about three weeks into a year-long collaboration. The difficulty in, in deriving results like this really isn't in deriving high-level structure of these algorithms. It's in the fastidiousness that you need to take that high-level algorithm and to break it down into low-level primitives that are amenable to resource estimation. And then the meticulous process of doing all of the tedious bookkeeping that you need to resource estimate these algorithms by hand. And that consumes 95% of the time needed to generate results like this. The data on the right hand side does demonstrate the output of this work. And you can see that there are resource estimates for a variety of molecular systems and a variety of observables in a variety of different basis sets. Uh, but it's, you know, I can't stress enough how painful it is to produce data that is of this caliber. And this is generic across the field. right? So if you want to take a broad computational statement and push it all the way through to an explicit statement of, of resource estimation, the workflow looks something like this. So it takes of the order of weeks to refine that computational problem, to marry it to a quantum algorithm specified at a high level. It might take a month or two to instantiate that thing, either with a sufficient level of theory or in code. And then it'll take months or weeks, two or three of each, to compile that thing to low-level low level primitives, to carry out the resource estimation, and then to invoke some kind of optimization if the numbers are too big. And if you believe that full-tolerant quantum computers will be here within the decade, at this rate, this gives us half a dozen cycles at most to derive meaningful applications for these machines. And clearly, we're not moving quickly enough. The second thing to say is that we are still, for better or worse, in a world where 95% of quantum application developers are building NISC algorithms. And there's often a misapprehension lying under the surface here, which is that a fault-tolerant quantum computer is just a, a larger or more capable version of a, a NISC device, much in the same way that you know this uh, old Intel microprocessor is just a, a slower, less capable version of its modern-day counterpart. But that's not the comparison you should make. The comparison you should make is, is this. It's an old Intel microprocessor versus a high-performance supercomputer. And I don't think anyone in this room would contend that the Frontier supercomputer is just a larger, more capable version of the microprocessor on the left. At some point, the difference in scale and the difference in capabilities is so significant that it necessitates new infrastructure, new architectures, and entirely new ways of designing applications and, and software. And I should highlight that that is emphatically the case when we are designing fault-tolerant quantum algorithms. So this is an unpacked schematic of the structure of the algorithm, the chemistry algorithm that we saw a few slides ago. And you can see that it has a, a fairly complex nested structure. So it's invoking quantum phase estimation twice in two very different ways. Uh, that inner phase estimation is itself invoking quantum signal processing. That quantum signal processing is itself invoking, invoking some novel cubitization, et cetera, et cetera. And not only are, is you know, the entirety of this algorithm not suitable for running on a device where you have a limited number of qubits and a limited amount of coherence, even the constituent subroutines of this algorithm are not suitable for devices with limited number of qubits and a limited amount of coherence. 
And the upshot of this is that you know, fault-tolerant algorithm developers are largely developing algorithms that are totally alien to people that are working on, on NISC. And moreover, expertise and accrued experience in building NISC algorithms is largely tangential to the kinds of expertise and experience that you need in building fault-tolerant algorithms. Okay. Luckily, there are some solutions to these problems, and they don't necessarily predicate a, a PhD in quantum computing to understand. So I've highlighted three just with the brackets at the bottom of the slide, so let's, let's step through them. On down-selecting algorithms, uh, the main problem, I think, is, is reusability. So it's very difficult to take the algorithm as specified on the previous slide, or indeed, if you just pull the paper from the archive, and repurpose it for a slightly different task, or substitute out constituent subroutines for a new variant if you come up with something that is, uh, that is better or more optimized. And instead, this fault-tolerant algorithm development often requires algorithm developers to start entirely from scratch, or it requires them to carry around the entirety of the literature on, on the compilation of quantum algorithms in their head. And what we would rather have is uh, a general purpose, ubiquitous library of pre-compiled subroutines that algorithm designers can, can reasonably pull upon, written in such a way that you can deploy them modularly, much in the same way that you could deploy them in this, in this nested structure in the algorithm that we saw on the previous slide. On instantiation and compilation, the, the primary driver to, to accelerating this process is to specify high-level languages for quantum algorithms. And so, uh, you know, specifying languages for quantum algorithms at a high level and abstracting away low-level compilation details uh, frees up a lot of uh, time that application developers would have been spent bookkeeping low-level details of quantum algorithms and allows them to iterate much more quickly on high-level designs of quantum algorithms. It means they get to uh, valid and optimal algorithms significantly faster. And lastly, having those automated compilation tools makes resource estimation a push-button exercise. And if we can appropriately cache and store those uh, compiled algorithms in a modular fashion, then any time we come up with a new variant of a subroutine that we think is better than what we currently have, we can substitute that into the, the algorithms that we have uh, uh, built into our library uh, and provide uh, updated resource estimates across the board. And in fact, I'm going to give you um, a flavor of some of PsyQuantum's progress on, on these three points in the next few slides. OK, so on building a, a library of, of use cases for, for quantum algorithms and quantum applications, we've taken a, a dual approach. So on the theory side, we've pushed towards building, uh, building out the breadth of ubiquitous quantum algorithms that previously had only a big O attached and now have an explicitly compiled version where we can tease out all the constant factors and understand exactly how they compile. But on the software side, we've built out a, a fairly easy to use software framework that allows us to readily implement these, these algorithms in code. So we'll talk about the, the former on the, on the next slide. But on the latter, you'll see here a snapshot of the set of computational primitives that we can already invoke. And it's now fairly extensive and robust as a toolset with respect to modern quantum computational primitives. So there's alias sampling and various flavors of amplitude amplification and LCU and cubitization methods and signal processing further down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these things are written in a way that are, um, are modular, so you can nest them in a way that we have seen in the algorithm that was shown on the previous slide. And most of the uh, constituent subroutines that we've implemented are ubiquitous across a variety of algorithms. And they've been written in a way as to be application agnostic as possible. And we'll see a, a, an example of that in a few slides time. OK, so on the former, the quantum chemistry example is a, is a good example of uh, an algorithm that has gone from a big O scaling to precise resource estimates, in this case for computing molecular observables of quantum chemistry models. But that isn't the only thing that we've done in the last year or so. So just to give you a couple of highlights, we've also published uh, a linear solver algorithm with world record efficiency. We've published the first explicitly compiled quantum algorithm for solving differential equations. 
And by closely coupling the, the algorithm design with the details of the architecture and error correction that sits underneath, uh, we can drop the resource requirements for both RSA and elliptic curve cryptography significantly. So in fact, this paper outperforms previous resource estimates for this problem by about two orders of magnitude. Regarding compilation, I can give you an explicit example to demonstrate our approach. So this is a, a script that is uh, invoking a ubiquitous subroutine known as a QROM or a data lookup. Algorithms for us are instantiated using, well, a simple language that is just a wrapper on Python. Uh, and using the library that we saw on the previous slide, it's just instantiated with two lines of code, which you can possibly see at the, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and it's also instantiated in a way that's both largely agnostic about the, the constituent subroutines that make up that, that component, and also in a way that is agnostic about the data that is fed in. So that maximizes the modularity and reusability of the code. Compilation is handled by a filter pipeline that are arbitrarily composable and take a high-level quantum algorithm and sufficiently successively break it down into uh, lower and lower layers of abstraction until you get to some fundamental primitive set of gates that, uh, that match your quantum architecture. And lastly, on resource estimation and optimization, this is a snapshot of the tools that we built in this area. So I don't have time for a deep dive, but there are a few things that I'd like to highlight. So it's a little bit small, but it's worth saying that the graphical representation for quantum algorithms at this level is not a quantum circuit diagram. It is this topological object that you can see at the top that just retains the necessary information for carrying out resource estimation. And so each leaf in this diagram carries around a set of symbolic resource estimates. And then there is an engine that sits underneath that composes those symbolic resource estimates into resource estimates for constituent components and for the entire algorithm itself. So the prior art for this kind of bookkeeping is to do this process tediously by hand over many months. You then write a 90 page paper and you put it on the archive and you implore all of your colleagues to check whether it's correct or not. And clearly this approach is faster, it's much more transparent in how the algorithms are constructed, and it can be fed to automatic verification tools. Also, once the algorithm designer decides they want to plug in a particular problem instance for the resource estimates they're interested in, they can specify parameter values, and rather than getting just a top-line estimate of the total number of gates and qubits for the algorithm itself, you can get richer resource estimation information so in particular, the output here is a cool graph with a heat map that demonstrates precisely where the quantum algorithm is bottlenecking in resources, which is precisely what you want to know if you want to iterate through new quantum algorithm designs. Okay, so to conclude, I hope this talk has given some insight into the, the progress that we've made in developing uh, quantum applications and the tooling to support them. We are always willing to, to speak to both practitioners and end users of these tools. So if you are a quantum algorithms developer that wants to expedite your algorithm development process, or you're an end user that wants to marry these tools with a particular application, please come and speak to us. And then the last thing to say is that uh, this has been primarily about algorithms and tools. If you want to know about applications uh, more specifically, in this case, in the context of quantum computing, our head of quantum solutions, Philip Ernst, will be uh, hosting a discussion with Yanni Gambros of QCWare. So please scan the QR code or speak to either us or a representative from QCWare if you're interested. Do you have some time for questions if there are any questions? You, um, you've talked about the large difference between NISC and fault tolerance mm. and most of the talk you said how you um, estimate the resources for fault tolerant computing. That's right. Did you also try to do any resource estimation for NISC algorithms? Uh, no, for a couple of reasons. One is that Quantum doesn't plan on building any NISC systems. That's the main one. But the other is that uh, the framework relies on the algorithm lacking this kind of heuristic nature that you might expect for NISC algorithms. So the precise reason why we can go through this resource estimation procedure is that even in advance of running the algorithm, I can be explicit about how long it takes to run, which is not something you get with a, a NISC device. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.